Straight Talk Live. My name is Rick Snyder. I'm one of your co-hosts. And Straight Talk Live is a nonprofit uh, webcast and podcast show where we explore the pillars of human transformation, digital transformation, and social impact. And really, this came about from um, just the really chaotic times that we've all experienced recently around the pandemic and realizing our whole world is changing and needs to change in these key areas, and that we're not actually having the conversations and asking the questions that we need to be asking. And that's painfully obvious whenever we turn in onto the media, we see the news cycles, the same talk tracks, and realizing there's so much more that we need to be uncovering in all these key areas. And so this show is dedicated to getting underneath those conversations and really getting at the crux of what, how does transformation actually happen? What do we need to tackle and get underneath to be able to empower more of us to get out there and make the change that needs to happen. So today, I wanna to first introduce my special co-host and friend and comrade, um, Af Maholtra. Af, do you wanna say a little bit about what has you excited about the show today? Thank you, Rick. Again, one of our um, most um, exciting topics, psychological safety. Um, you guys know who I am. I'm the co-creator of straighttalk.live and, of course, the co-founder of Growth Enabler, an AI business that I founded a few years ago. Uh, again, it's sort of tradition when we start these shows, I always say I'm very excited. I'm always excited, of course. There's a lot of energy here. This topic is close to my heart because I used to be in the corporate for a number of years and I left the corporate and I built my own company. And then I started to realize what psychological safety was. And uh, I can't wait to ask our guests this question because they both have spent a number of years in leadership positions in the corporate. And um, I'm getting ready for this. This is an exciting one, Rick. So over to you, buddy. And then let's, let's crack on with this conversation. Yeah. And I, you know, whenever you introduce yourself, I always forget that to introduce myself personally as well. Um, and so just for those of you who don't know who I am, um, I'm the author of Decisive Intuition, the CEO, CEO, not the COO, the CEO of Invisible Edge. And one of the things in my book that I actually talk about around intuitive intelligence is this concept of psychological safety. And there's this really interesting relationship between safety and risk. And that's really the heart of what we're going to get into today, that to the degree that you can actually take real leaps of innovation and un or making friends with the unknown, there has to be some foundation of safety, some foundation of uh, comfort and what's acceptable and, and, and we're, how, what, what are the rules that we can play within? And then how can we break those rules? There's a really interesting relationship between those that we're going to dive deeply into today. So Rick, without further ado. Rick, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Yeah. Before you start off, uh, I just want to, I found this an excellent quote and I think the, the audience will love it because I was trying to work out what the definition of psychological safety was really. And Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School sums it up beautifully. She said, psychological safety is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up, uh, be it ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. So with that in mind, over to you, Rick, and let's, let's uh, meet up our guests today. Let's crack on. So um, I'm very excited to introduce our two special guests today who, as Af was mentioning, have been incredible thought leaders, uh, pioneers, um, and innovators in the corporate and um, startup spaces as well. Um, and so we're, we want to introduce Hema and Kate to our show. Welcome to you both. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And let's start with Hema. If you just introduce yourself, give us, give your audience, our audience a little bit of your background for those who don't know who you are, and then let's go to Kate as well. Sure, absolutely. Hi, everybody. My name is Hema. Um, my background has been, I've spent many years in kind of the financial services industry, uh, technology industry, um, focused purely in the space of kind of people, strategy, and innovation. Um, the kind of traditional roles I did was things like head of resourcing at Santander and organizations like that. And then I went on to set up their future of work practice. So fundamentally looking at how organizations navigate uncertainty and complexity um, and what they need to do from a, a cultural perspective to kind of navigate some of that. Um, I too left the corporate world a few years back um, and set up my own business. Um, and I focus purely on the future of work and 
helping leaders and founders kind of spot the unseen opportunity amidst disruption. That's me. Thank you. Kate. So my name is Kate Bon. Um, I am in financial services. I haven't left the corporate world yet. The, there's hope for me yet though, there's still time. Um, I don't have a traditional financial services background in as much as that I was in the art world for the first 10 years of my career. And then it's the last 20 that I've been in financial services. Still don't think of myself as a banker. Still don't feel that I necessarily understand everything about that. But so the roles that I have undertaken within financial services have been relatively creative. So in the early days, that would have been sort of e-commerce. And how do we leverage these newfangled things like the internet to simplify the lives of our customers, whether that's internal customers or external customers. Um, and really driving simplification and democratization of access and inclusion, really, in terms of what is financial services as a business and also what is it as a, an end user, whether that's a commercial bank, a retail bank, or very many other things. So at the moment, I'm with Lloyd's Banking Group, and that's a plethora of different brands from Scottish Widows to Halifax to Lloyd's High Street Bank, which people recognize, as well as Black Horse Insurance for Cars and uh, Lex Leasing, plus MBA credit cards as of last year. Um, and really trying to look at how we create simplification within that, how, how we create accessibility and, and, and just leverage some of the amazing capability and partnership opportunities that are out there to um, accelerate our way through to that more customer friendly, customer focused uh, end setup. Excellent. Wow. Um, you both have such rich backgrounds. So thank you both. And let's dive right in. So let's start more personal here. And obviously we're talking about psychological safety and that being the springboard for next gen enterprises. How is that going? Uh, <laughs> you both are very involved out there in the world. How's that whole conversation going? And why do you personally care so much about this topic? Who'd like to go first? How about Emma? Sure, well, I'll go first. I think, um, I think for me, there's a real, I think I, there's real recognition for me that I think ideas come from anywhere. Um, really good ideas come from anywhere in places that you don't expect to find them. And I, in the time that I've been working with organizations where they're having to face increasingly complex challenges, whether it's people related or customer related, um, it's, it's really clear that actually we, leaders don't have all the answers. And I've seen in so many times, organizations have struggled to innovate or come up with new ideas or be truly creative um, because of, they have not been able to access some of, the, some of those thoughts, those ideas, those perspectives that come within an organization. Um, I think the fabric within an organization is so rich. And I think the resources within a business are really often left untapped. So thoughts, ideas, perspectives, um, lived experiences, there's so much in there. And I think often a reason why it's left untapped is because there is this fear to speak up and there's this, um, this fear of being seen and perhaps not being welcomed into the conversation. And I just think it's such a missed opportunity. So I've seen it firsthand. I've experienced cultures that don't allow you or you don't feel unable to, to voice your opinions openly. I know what it feels like to be inside that. And I've also seen the impact it's had on both large organizations, but also smaller startups and scale-ups. So I think in a world where we're moving so quickly, where we're having to innovate, we're having to think differently, we're facing new things constantly, it's such an important element to be able to create value. So yeah, a missed opportunity, I think, for me, if we, if we don't tackle it. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would absolutely agree with Hema and, and build on that in terms of, you know, I think we've all experienced being in spaces that are psychologically safe or are not and haven't necessarily realised that in the moment uh, early on in our career. But that, that environment that nurtures you to feel included, to feel safe, to ask questions, to learn, to expand your understanding and contribute as well as, as challenge the status quo without it seeing as a, being seen as a, a, like a direct challenge to whoever's in charge, their fiefdom, their ego, whatever it might be. 
and just to sort of go, well, why is it like that? And is there a better way? And as you have those differences of, of thoughts and experiences and heritages and backgrounds, that sort of full diversity of thought, you know, it just ensures that you are bringing everybody into whatever the, the outcome is and therefore the outcome will be more robust than if you just had a very narrow view of, you know, one person or the highest paid person in the room saying, this is the answer, therefore that's what we have to do. So, you know, for me, it's like an imperative given that I don't have a financial services background and I certainly started not having a, a clue about any, you know, any of the language that's used, you know, the acronyms left, right and centre. Everybody loves the three letter acronym, right? Um, but the ability to say when, when someone says SME, well, what is that? Are we talking about a subject matter expert? Are we talking about a small, medium enterprise? You know, there's an element of like, can we step away from the acronyms? Can we be bold and ask the question that probably nine out of 10 of the other people in the room would ask as well if they, if they were able to put their sort of ego to one side or, or have no shame to some extent. And on one hand, I think the women do that really well because they probably do have less ego coming to it and they do want to understand. Um, but then it would be really nice if everybody felt that they were able to do that as well. Do you think, um, it's for both of you actually, do you think psychological safety, the concept of being able to speak your mind and be open and authentic, authentic, that's an interesting word, because we talk about authenticity and leadership a lot now, and uh, being real, uh, being true to yourself, speaking from the heart, being intuitive, all of these great things that we um, invariably end up doing when we're hanging around with mates or friends or people that are close to us. And for some bizarre reason, as soon as you enter the environment or the, the world of the corporate, physical and or virtual, in fact, that's another discussion, is it, are you more psych psychologically safe or unsafe in a physical environment like an office? And I know, Kate, you've got some stuff to say about this. Um, or actually, is this whole virtual setting of being on the back of these video call conferencing systems making psychological safety um, easier? Um, my question, though, for both of you and, and whoever wants to go first is, uh, is psychological safety a bullshit topic? Is it fallacy? Are we just wasting our time having this discussion in the corporate because the corporate structures, big multi-billion dollar companies run on incremental growth. They run on predictability. They run on the systems working the way they need to work. So how dare you speak up? I mean, even, even, when, if, even if you decide to be psychologically uh, enabled and feel safe, there's still a threshold, no? There's still a glass ceiling. So... Um, and, you know, we all know this, and let's talk about it openly and um, within the confines of this safe space. You're, we're safe psychologically here at straighttalk.live. So what do you think? What, what have you got to say? What's your viewpoint? Let's, let's cut through the noise and get to whether this psychological, psychological safety concept is, um, is real and practiced the way we think it should be practiced in the corporate. And we'll talk about startups later, of course, but... Go on, you know, over to any of you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to go. Um, so yes, yeah, psychological safety, it's a new trendy term, right? Everyone's talking about it. Bring your whole self to work. Um, but it's bring your whole self to work as long as the people who are at work find that acceptable. And that will vary from team to team, from line manager to line manager. Things that are not um, shaped into a formal policy will be implemented in different ways, although it can be colloquially sort of bandied about. You know, one person's experience in one team will be completely different to another person's experience in another team. And the opportunity to speak without having to second guess whether you are using the correct language or um, terminology or whatever it might be. You know, if you want to engage in a conversation with something that you don't necessarily know about, you have to be comfortable to maybe use the wrong words and have people understand that your question comes from a good place and a curious place and have them respond in a way that educates you without being patronizing or um, derogatory or derisive. Um, so that, that's definitely tricky in a corporate environment. Um, and there is an element of, you know, all those, those um, surveys that they, they do that says, you know, it's going yeah. to be an anonymous survey. But by the time you've ticked the box that says, I sit in this area, I'm at this grade, um, I've been here this many years, I'm male or female or whatever, they know exactly who you are. And so your ability to be transparent with how you actually feel about stuff as opposed to what you feel you're supposed to say 
is actually quite minimal or, or actually people don't engage at all. And, and what you do is you get the consensus view of the few people who are happy to put commentary down who are either very senior and therefore feel comfortable with saying their truth or uh, everybody just, or the truth is that they're completely happy and comfortable. And so what comes back from all these anonymous surveys is everyone's great, everyone's you know, doing really well, but we could be doing a bit better in these areas, but they've only got 32% of their population voicing an opinion. Um, and, and that continues to shape a forward progress. So um, I, think, I think it's quite tricky in as much as um, the buzzwords are there and the box ticking exercises are there, but the execution and the implementation isn't quite there yet. Um, I don't know, Emma, what do, what do you feel? I think, I think I'd agree with you, Kate, for sure. I think the other thing, after you asked if it was like a, I think you used the word bullshit, is it a bit of a bullshit term and actually it doesn't really mean anything in organisations? And I think there is a buzzword, but actually if you unpick the buzzword and really understand what it means, I think is massively important. For, for me, it's really linked to organization success, it's linked to performance. And for me, performance and success of a business, as well as it's the way it feels within an organization, that's, that's what a business is all about. How do they succeed? How do they perform? How do they grow? And having high levels of psychological safety with high expectations and standards creates this focus on learning and this culture that create a high performance culture and environment that just you know helps a business to grow and innovate and I think when you look at it through that lens I don't think you can um, argue that it's important to an organization I think it's really important do buzzwords exist and people sometimes use, this, use them in the HR space and nobody really knows what it means for sure could we unpick them and understand what it looks like what behaviours does it mean for a, a like a, a leader? What does it mean for the employee? How is it defined? What does that look and feel like in practice, like through practical application? Actually, if you do some of that stuff, you can make real powerful shifts in a business, but it does require, I think it requires bravery, it requires honesty and people wanting to, in, genuinely wanting to create an environment that is high performing. Um, but I, I, mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think the problem is with using the phrase high performing, I, I love everything you just said, Hema, but the, the, the high performing piece suggests that the learning and the curiosity has to almost be perfect before you engage, because I think Alf, you were saying about the opportunity to fail, yeah. Um, yeah. To, to not know things in the first instance, to be able to ask those questions. If the, it, yes, the outcome will be a high performing culture and it will be probably a highly profitable or more profitable entity. But um, there's almost kind of like this, this piece around it says it's okay if it's on that bit, but it's not okay if it's that bit. I, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Kate. And I, I think for me, high performing culture, I, I think doesn't necessarily mean it's a place where you can't make mistakes. I think for me, that, that, focus on continuous learning and that space to be able to make mistakes, be able to not just make mistakes, but share when you've made a mistake is part of that. And I, I totally get that. I agree. Um, I think it's a huge part of being able to create progress. Um, mm. Yeah, no, this is, I love that you're mentioning this because you're right. It could be a buzzword, like anything. Authenticity can be a buzzword. Anything can be. And yet when you really dig down deeper, what is effective leadership? That's really the question. Like what, how, when you actually see people leaders who are people leaders, yeah. <laughs> who are effective, right? I mean, crazy thought, but people leaders who are actually people leaders, not just individual contributors mm -hmm. who are great at their you know, craft or whatever they do, but people who know how to actually inspire the best out of those around them. And, but, and they know they how to create that, right? Yeah, but we don't, nobody's shown how to do that. I mean, some people inherently get the sort of servant leadership perspective and how do I encourage my people to grow, to be better, to be more aware. But, but nobody, when they get promoted, nobody takes right. them on to one side and, and, and handholds them through that process. They just go, oh, you are really good at doing that job. So you now get to manage all the people who do that job. And so you're taken away potentially from the thing that you love and you're mm -hmm. told to deal with all the nuances that individual characters bring with them or the baggage that they bring with them and to, and to manage them and lead them. And, and we have any number of sort of managers who sit there going, you will just do it in my vision. 
and they're not interested in leading, but they are seen to be a leader. Um, and they don't invite curiosity. They invite regimentation and um, replication of what they want rather than that true, are we doing the right thing? Or, you know, is there a moral imperative that we do something else? It's just like, it's always been done like this. We'll do it like this. Keep doing it like that. Mm. And the minute you step outside of those boundaries, it's not acceptable. I, I wonder, as I listen to you, to you both, and, and Rick posed a good point around leadership, I wonder if we're, if we're asking for too much mm-hmm. from the big company, from the big corporate. Uh, let me, let me, let me put, put some context around that. So if you think about a startup and you think about a young company, that's small, it's agile, it's disruptive by definition, it's an undertaking, it's all about build, test, measure, learn. It's about breaking things and starting again. It's about living a dream. It's about all of those things. You get together with a collective, a group of people, a tribe, and you try and do some stuff together. You know, it could be the local community project. It could be the glorious startup that turns into a unicorn or or similar. And I get that because in my company, we have tons of psychological safety because we're on that journey. But what I'm starting to realize is when you get bigger and you start scaling and you have more and more managers, more and more people, you want them to be like you. You want them to be, um, you know, enforcing and living up to the DNA of your culture, which is about authenticity and making people feel comfortable and failing fast and all of those good things. But there's a big issue here, which, which um, goes in hand in glove with becoming big as a company. We start employing millions or thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, which is the fact that, um, A, you cannot guarantee that the line manager, it's a mid-management problem as well, is reinforcing and living and breathing um, your culture. And we know that, of course, and, and some do it really well, others struggle. And psychological safety and making your team feel comfortable is one part of that. That's one kind of risk that's very hard to manage, and it's like an eternal... Uh, problem that large companies are trying to solve. The, the other issue, um, I think, relates to the fact that um, if, you th- if you look at an organization like Google, and Google back in 2015 had this project called Oxygen, and they did a study and they realized that actually it's not about IQ or seniority of team, it's about this thing called psychological safety. And then they created something else called Project Aristotle, which interestingly I have an interesting model in front of me, which uh, got me thinking. This model's got five blocks to it, right? And we've touched on some of these. The first block is psychological safety, right at the top, most important. Um, The second block is dependability, which is to do with getting things done on time and meeting high standards of excellence, high performance, which I think the corporates do really well, right? The third is about structure and clarity. Do I know what job I'm supposed to do? Do I know how I'm going to be measured? Have I got clear? Uh, have I got a clear role plan around my role and goals and objectives? All that good stuff, you know, smart objectives and so on. That's the third area. The fourth area is meaning. This is where it gets funky. Work is personally important to me and my team members. This is about sense of purpose. Question mark. This is where I would say that the corporate has lost its way. The traditional corporate has lost its way. I don't know about banks, but it'd be interesting to discuss that. The fifth area, very interesting area, is impact. Team members think their work matters and uh, they're creating change, creating value. So let me ask you this. Psychological safety is at the top. We're going to debate that. Dependability and structure and clarity. I'm I'm going to be assumptive and say, yeah, I think the corporates do that really well. And they invest tons of money in training and so on around that. And the managers are trained well around that. Four and five, meaning and impact. That's where it starts to get a little bit gray. Don't you agree? Um, What are your experiences? Um, Do you really think there's a deep sense of purpose when you go into your work? And, you know, is psychological safety, meaning and impact all interconnected? And um, for discussion, and then I have another point to this that I want to just bring up. But, you know, maybe, Kate, you start. Um, yeah, meaning, meaning and purpose is, is super important. If you feel that all you're doing is shuffling bits of paper around, like what's the point after a while, you know, or you'll just be visiting the same things again and again and again to no real impact or effect, then, um, I think as human beings, that's pretty soulless. And even if you said to someone, but we'll pay you lots of money to do it, 
Yeah. Um, after a while, nobody's paid enough money to just sit there and do things that are you know, utterly pointless um, or that they don't understand how it fits. It may feel pointless, but actually there's a context and a bigger picture that maybe they're not aware of um, that they need to be um, involved in or at least educated in and, and, and that they actually are a, a foundational piece of something bigger that they maybe don't see. But um, yeah, I think there's an element of um, mutual respect that's required that has to be demonstrated. Um, and that begets in, in itself an element of psychological safety um, because you, you as a receiver of that respect feel that you are empowered to have a voice, to have an opinion, to be involved. Um, and therefore, if you have that, you can also say, well, hang on a second, what am I doing? And what's this for? And um, is it really going to have any impact? Or are we just moving chairs on the Titanic kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes you're absolutely right. In large corporations, it's very easy for people to hide. It's very easy for people to have seemingly zero responsibility or accountability at so many different levels. And, and, and particularly in our Sort of you know we we had the 2008 crash and then it was very much command and control and nobody said yes to anything and it all came from a central point and now we're moving back the other way where the fca particularly in banks is is giving people the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law so that um there is that ability to be a bit more nimble and appropriate and no more that sort of like well it wasn't illegal um, you didn't you didn't say I couldn't, therefore I did it. And it's just like, well, there's a spirit to what we're asking people to do. And therefore, you know, it, it becomes a bit more vague. But because of you know, you've got the senior manager certification regime and all those kind of things that say if you make the wrong decision, you're going to prison. Um, even if it's seven years down the line kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so people get terribly nervous about being the person who said yes. Um and, and so that also makes the whole process quite opaque. Mm. Do you think, just before we move on, again, another thought, been provocative. Do you think, when I said it's too much to ask, right? Large companies, large enterprises, banking in particular, let's just go out for, you know, all in. <laughs> banking is one of the most risk averse industries, not insurance, banking is one of the most risk averse industries on, on the planet. They, they regulated like you cannot imagine, as you know. Um, if you fancy, if you're an employee or an associate and you want psychological safety, isn't it really simple that a banking institution is not going to give it to you because they seek predictability. They want everything to work in a systematic way. They don't want to break too much, just enough, not too much failure, Kate, just enough. And, um, but isn't that a bit of an oxymoron? Because people are willingly going into banking institutions seeking psychological safety, but in reality, the entire makeup of that industry doesn't allow it. It's not built for that um, process. Throwing it out there, but you know. I, I would completely disagree, <laughs> just, just to be Great. inflammatory. Um, so I would completely disagree because actually it is so risk averse. You, you do need to have that psychological safety that allows and enables people to call out issues in real time, to, to capture them, to, to have that sort of um, risk elevator, if you like, that says, I see a risk. Can I just flag it maybe at a local level that says, I think this is a risk, um, not yet an issue. Do we have mitigants? Am I... Am I maybe misunderstanding or misinformed about the level of that risk or where it's being captured somewhere else so we're all okay um so you need to have that psychological safety to start the element that says here is absolute transparency about the things that could go wrong the things that i see that aren't working the things that are manifesting that are not appropriate behaviors or attitude or whatever it might be you know i'll, I'll get over the fact it's not a meritocracy <clears throat> yeah. Because we all know it's not. Um, but uh, you need, it almost behoves us to have psychological safety so that we can call that out and we don't end up with a, oh, I didn't see it, I didn't know, nobody said. Because that's no, that's, that's sort of no um, alibi when it comes to having gone wrong. You know, we are trusted with people's money, you know, their security, their, their life, their well-being. 
and and therefore we should be engendering an environment that allows anybody to call out anything the same way you know um you know black box thinking and airplanes and, and and you've had really bad crashes where you know somebody junior in the cockpit has said you know there's a problem and the, and the pilot goes there's not um you know shut up i'm the pilot and and now they have a a I don't know if it's a legal requirement that they are have all been mandated that everybody in the co cockpit has a voice to speak up and raise concerns in real time and to be taken seriously and, and be considered and that's working brilliantly so I actually don't see why any company in any industry shouldn't be manifesting that same behavior do you th do you think sorry I'm just uh, and Hema this is for you do you think because you you raised a few points and a few have sparked um, some questions first one is in in essence what you're saying is a few things in inferring from what you said um, I wonder whether the seniority of your role or highly skilled roles are more privileged because they have the ability to more to practice psychological safety because you can only practice psychological safety if you've got a big job or you know an important job as opposed to a less important job and i won't i won't name the jobs mm -hmm. and so you can speak to your boss or the boss's boss or minus three from ceo and influence right that's one part so is psychological safety about privilege based on the type of job you have um mm -hmm. first point anyway I'll, I'll throw that to Hema because she's going no 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 how dare you um go on yeah, no, no, yeah, I'll answer. Otherwise, I'll forget the next. Uh, the next. Uh, for me, it's not about privilege. I think it's around culture, and it's around behaviour, and it's around attitude. And I think, actually, the difference when it comes to psychological safety, it's not about influence, and it's not about trust. It's not about you establishing. In fact, I think this is a significant difference between psychological safety and what trust is. So I think trust is a a one to one thing where I could say something to you and I know you will be comfortable with me saying that back. Psychological safety is about I could say something to a room and know that the room wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't fear, you know, I wouldn't have any negative repercussions from that. And mm. so actually, whether you're in a boardroom, whether you're in a meeting room or, you know, with like your team or whether you're in the, it's a bad example, canteen, wherever you are, it's got, it's nothing to do, I think, about leadership and your level of seniority i think when you're a leader though you have a responsibility um and that's a different matter and that you know you asked earlier to kate you know do, is it too much to ask of a business i don't think it is i think asking leaders in organizations around being able to invite voice can they invite voice and can they invite opinion yeah. i don't think that's too much to ask can they um actively listen genuinely listen put aside their own thoughts their ideas and be really curious about what's going on i don't think that's too much i don't think that's too much to ask of a um let alone a ceo anybody at any organization on a very human level and i think those are the things that create psychological safety i think it's yeah. less less to do with like a seniority personally and i think you made an interesting point earlier also around what are leaders in businesses and often Big Kate said, you know, often you're promoted because you're really good at your craft and you, your expertise is um, sharpened. Just because you're amazing at marketing or whatever it might be, does not necessarily mean you're a natural people leader. And I think that's the other thing that organisations um, sometimes forget. So, yes, the answer is no in short to your, to your question. <laughs> You know, I want to jump in here. And by the way, I want to remind the audience, please ask your questions. We see a couple coming through, but keep asking your questions. We want to include those too. Um, we've been talking a lot about psychological safety and I want to get more specific about how do you actually create that? How do you, like, what's the actual ways that you bring that forward with your team, with yourself, uh, with your leadership? Um, and if you have any specific stories around that, where maybe you worked with a company or your own team internally, where there wasn't a sense of safety and what did you have to do to shift that? Okay, um, I can probably th a couple of things I think that come to mind around practical things that you can do and perhaps I can share. I think there is something around how, if you're in an organization, leader or not leader, how do you actively seek the opinions of other people around you? Like how do you find out, especially actually opposing views, things that are completely different to what you're, 
um, experiencing? How do you go out and inquire that? Because I think often we go and find um, opinions that support our own rather than vehemently oppose them. And I think that's a very powerful thing to be able to do. Um, I think there is something in creating spaces that truly allow collaboration. So often as leaders were presented with a solution. And I think especially in like large organizations where leaders think they need to have all the answers. I think those days are gone. They don't have all the answers. They're facing new problems that they've never had before. So how on earth can they have all the answers when there's no longer a blueprint or best in class to follow? So how can you practically engage with creative problem solving? And I think that's a very practical way to think differently and get some of, you know, inviting that voice back into, um, you know, into the conversation. And, you know, I think there's also something around destigmatizing failure. So how can you, you know, failure, I know we, talk, we touched on failure and high performance, and I think failure is a really important thing to be able to succeed. So how do you create a culture that allows that to happen, I think is, is hugely important. Um, yeah, those are some initial things that, that sprung to mind. That's excellent. Kate, do you have anything you want to add to that? It looks like you might be muted. Yes, sorry. Um, so the, the piece, I saw one of the comments went up in the chat around psychological safety is in sort of basically in the eye of the beholder. Um, and to some extent they're right, but that's to do with the consistency with which we experience that engagement with different people. So if someone, we can all be in the same team, but if our experience of the consistency of interaction with our leaders is different, to the consistency that somebody else is receiving, then we'll have different understandings of what psychological safety exists in that team. So yes, you're absolutely right, it's about the individual perception. But to Hannah's point, I think that there are absolutely things that we can do to support that being um, seen in a similar way across all different person, persons within those teams, while as a leader, recognizing that they will have different backgrounds, different cultures, they will have been brought up in different ways that manifest in behaviors that um, will create their own realities. So for example, one of, one of my colleagues in, in quite a lot of the sort of Black Lives Matter discussions, there was a piece around a colleague of mine who is, he's British, um, you know, born here, Indian heritage, and he has been brought up believing that you don't you don't engage with your, your seniors, your elders, you only speak to your peer set. So then when he's at work, you know, it, it doesn't cross his mind necessarily to engage with those people further up. He'll only do it with the people at the same level as him. So he's not able to um, sort of highlight or spotlight what he's doing. And therefore when it comes to promotions and those kind of things, he's potentially overlooked because people don't know who he is. When those senior people are in a room talking about stuff, his name doesn't come up because they, they don't engage with him. They don't know, really know who he is. So it's not just about hard work, it is about you know, bringing those people up, recognizing those different ways of behaving, the different ways that, that we um, have been brought up by our parents and our cultural heritages, or even our genders, you know, that whole thing of you know, men are gauged on what their potential is and women are gauged on what they have already achieved as to whether they should necessarily move forward or not. Um, so there are all those different nuances in it and, it, and, it's, and it's definitely a tricky one. But I think if we can just be consistent um, and if we're going to invite challenge, don't invite challenge and they get pissed off when it happens or mm. don't, don't, because one person could think they're just asking a question because they're curious and they don't understand the answer mm. or maybe they've been made aware of something that, that you don't know and and therefore you see the question as maybe someone being underhand or sly and you know we have to always think people come from a place of good intention there aren't many people who are just assholes there are a few mm -hmm. um but mostly you know we come from a place of good intent so if we can start with that position then we may find out they're an asshole later but um i think that that will enable some consistency when we engage with all the different styles and personalities that sit within a team. I think the other thing that's extraordinary here, I just want to touch on a very important point. And I think one of the, 
uh, audience members, either on Facebook or here, has raised it. It's extremely important in terms of the longevity, in terms of the sustainability, or like the new generation of companies and how psychological safety will be part of the DNA. That sort of hope or yeah. dream we have, right? Just on that sort of uh, umbrella topic, it, it appears, it seems, it seems interesting that hierarchy and versus flat structures has a lot to do with this, of course, or it's a driving factor or correlator. The other thing is culture. And I found this really interesting personally, having worked in different cultures, that um, the, the leader that you engage with in a culture that might be a low trust culture, you know, um, crabs in a bucket culture. It doesn't have to be about a nation. It can be a company that's a little bit toxic or massively hierarchical. And God forbid, I mean, some of us have experienced this in our lives and it's horrible, right? You never want to experience it again. It could put you off work forever, especially the younger generation. So if, if you're young and you listen to this, it's fine. You know, you've got to kiss a few frogs, but just be aware of companies that you think are too hierarchical, too many job titles, you know, director, VP, senior VP. And if when you have senior you know you've got a problem there because you know it's a way of uh, sort of uh, making someone feel great about the next step to the hierarchy. Uh, regardless, the point I want to make is related to culture and um, language. And you talked about, Kate, you referred to that uh, example in one of the books where you've got the, I don't know what airline it was, where the pilot said, go, I'm going to do this. And the, the, uh, the co-pilot or whoever it was didn't have the guts or the, the balls or he was intimidated by the hierarchy or the, just the culture of, of that particular um, set up and wasn't able to speak up. And I've seen this repeatedly in certain cultures, which is really disappointing. I feel gutted, like really demoralized when I'm on this. Well, I, I know people have got immense potential. They're so smart. If you speak to them over a, uh, on a one-on-one -on -one video call, they're like totally vomit everything on you. They're like, and it's this and it's that and it's this and I can solve this problem. As soon as you put them in a group setting and you've got, God forbid, anyone who's a little bit senior or has got some gray hair, that's it. They're like radio silent. And that is, that is horrible. Uh, it's suffocating, it's disabling, and it's almost like a cancer. And it, it creates a very negative um, sort of um, effect around confidence, where people aren't sure of their own capabilities. And then it's like self-perpetuating, it's like self-fulfilling, right? Next call, I, you know, I'm, I'm not used to speaking up, I'll just keep quiet and discuss it at the coffee machine. So let's accept that. And I think you're both nodding your heads, we all are. What, what should we do about it? Is there a solution or do we just accept that, well, in different cultures, they do it differently, just crack on now? And I say this because, you know, institutions are more global now, right? You've got brown, black, white, whatever it may be, types of people um, in all these organizations. And um, what, is there a solution? Is, or is, is there a way forward? Uh, or do we just leave it alone and say, look, just af, give it a break, will you? Um, what, <laughs> what's, the, what's the way forward? I don't, I don't think leaving it alone is a solution or the way forward. I think, I think it's really important to recognise, I think the point you made, Kate, around how some people, that individual, just doesn't feel, for example, able to speak up. And that might be due to um, upbringing or cultural background. But some of that stuff is really deep-rooted. And it's not that that individual doesn't have the ability, the skills, the, the knowledge, the ideas to move something forward but I think when you're in a position of leadership whoever you are whether you're CEO or whether you're you know any stage middle management wherever I think you have to use your ability in your platform productively and positively to enable and, up and lift up others and I think that's something we can do better and I think that doesn't happen enough so you know I think to expect people to always be able to do that and speak up and challenge. I mean, it's interesting. We talked about challenge and it's almost got a slight negative connotation. Mm -hmm. Whereas for me, challenge, I think, is a massively positive thing. And I think yeah. we talk about confrontation. Similarly, in our very British culture, confrontation is seen as a negative thing. I think when you've got challenge and confrontation absolutely done in a, the right way, creates the best friction and then the best outcomes come from there. And not everyone I feel is going to be able and comfortable to just step into that space, but then it's our job to help people get into that space and help yeah. support. And I think that's, I think that's one of the things that we can do. I think acknowledging it and thinking, well, that's just the cancer. We have to accept it. I don't think is what we should be doing. How about, I, mean, I just, 
Oh, Sorry, go on, go on, Rick. Yeah, go I just want I just want to uh, highlight what you just said right there because I think a lot of times people who might be hearing this right now think that there's these opposites of either safety or like grit and courage and risk, and somehow they're opposite. They're mutually exclusive. That oh, I just want to keep things safe and keep them comfortable. That's not what we're saying here. <laughs> In fact, they really feed off each other. And I, what I hear you say, Hema, is when you have that foundation of trust, you can actually have healthy conflict. You can actually have disagreement. In fact, that's actually where innovation and new thoughts come from is when you're able to be comfortable enough to say to your peers or your line manager or whoever it might be, hey, actually, I don't think it is that way. I think it's this way or I don't agree at all. And that's where, to me, aliveness comes from. So I just want to, on the back of this, throw, uh, include a, um, one of the questions from Matteo who asks, to what extent is the relationship or overlap between organizational responsibility for psychological safety and individual responsibility to develop personal grit? But it, it's quite exhausting if you're in a, if you're in a toxic space but, mm -hmm. and you know it's toxic and you're the one calling it out and you're the one sort of leaving your forehead on the wall in the process. You know, your personal resilience, your personal mental health is going to take a toll with that. If, mm. if everyone else is stepping back and kind of going, ooh, you know, what do you think you're doing? Um, so there is a personal responsibility to call it out, but at the same time, it can't always be left to one person because they, mm. will, they will die in the trying, um, which, which isn't kind or, you know, correct. But at the same time, you know, we do need we do need people who can have courage and have grit and be prepared to sort of take it on and, and be that protagonist that says, you know, it's not right. But we need people to be brave enough to say we can't necessarily lead the charge, but we'll we'll come with you and say, Yes, we've experienced that too. You know, yes, we you know, we also believe that something should be different. Um don't don't just let those few individuals take it on in the in and of themselves, because you know, that's never going to change anything. But then you equally have to recognize that it's sort of a bit like battered wife syndrome. Mm. You know, once, you, once you've been put in a space that's that toxic and it has removed your confidence, it's removed your ability or you, you think you've had the ability to have a voice removed from you, it does become very safe to just sit there and, and believe mm -hmm. what's given to you. And then when you're created, when you're maybe moved into a different space, because it's not familiar, it feels uncomfortable. So you also, everyone has to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and, and being able to debate and question and, and be curious. You know, if we're, if we're not curious, then, you know, we may as well just give up and go home. Hmm. Are, are we saying, again, um, the question is deliberate. It's a leading question. Are we saying 15 years ago or 20 years ago when, when we were being taught by, you know, all of the MBA geniuses and professors from Ivy League universities in Oxford and Cambridge uh, about um, organizational behavior and salaries and incentives and budgeting and planning and situational leadership. Do you remember that one? Yeah, which was very powerful um, where you, we're looking at confidence and competence and you're looking at coaching and supporting roles. Surely, psych whatever it was called then, psychological safety has been around for ages. Um, hence, we've had a thriving economy. Hence, we've got these large organizations and people growing and excelling. It's not a new phenomena, is it? Um, I think, um, question mark. I, I don't think... So I think the way that work has evolved, the nature of work and the way that people and work come together has changed over years. You know, so okay. if you look back, it's no longer... We're not just factories and people, you know, machines. We then moved into a place of kind of automation and, you know, kind of office work. And it was a different type where maybe a command and control organization and that those elements were important. But if you look at the type of work that we have now, that's not just, you know, how we create value with the rise of technology and technology, meaning that um, individuals can create value, you know, create their own businesses overnight if they want to i mean you know what i mean they have the ability to do all of that mm. the way people create value and create value for themselves for for other customers it's massively changed technology has massively changed that bit so for me because the way work has changed the way that people and, and technology have come together have created a very different way of creating value i mm. think 
the ways of working have to change. And I think now we're in a place where actually creativity is super important. Innovation is super important. We've seen, we, we keep talking about the banking industry, but we have seen really visibly in both the organizations, perhaps Kate and I have worked in that um, startups and new entrants have really disrupted certain parts of the banking sector in ways that were not imagined before. And I think because of that, a very new approach to how you do things, create value, think differently is so important. And I think it's an increased, it's a massive spotlight. I think the spotlight is being shone on the ability to be able to speak up, to be able to speak up without any fear to engage in some of that stuff. And did you need to be able to speak up in the past? Maybe, was it as important? I'm not sure, but I know that it's super important now. And I think that's the thing where we need to be constantly sensing our environments and our context. And that's where I think the importance sits. You need to be able to do that continuously. Whether you're an individual, whether you're a business, I think it's equally important. I mean, every situation has a, every situation has a yin and yang, Kate, right? And um, don't you think people will also abuse this? Um, I'm not saying we will, but um, there's a fine line between using psychological safety as your crutch or your get out of jail free card. Um, and I'm certain playing devil's advocate, um, contrarian view, that there will be people taking the piss and uh, harassment, HR related issues. And many of them are legit, of course, but many aren't. So and what are we teaching the next generation that, you know, um, the playground of the corporate is, uh, you know, you're constantly got mummy and daddy of the HR looking after you. And I, and I think it's important. But do people take the mickey? You think this is like, uh, we're good people like us may not, but of course, you have all sorts in the world. So where's the where's that fine line? And there's a question from Bill Frez, I want to ask in a second, but but Kate, over to you. So I would say that there will always be people that take the piss. It's a, it's a bit like, you know, when we've had all our kids learning from you know, school, school work from home, um, you know, instead of playing the prank with a pinging rubber band or, you know, a piece of chalk or whatever it might be these days in the classroom, they're finding ways to sort of say, oh, my camera doesn't work or mute their teacher at a, at a sort of massive session. You know, those, those, those needs to sort of push back and, and engage in different ways persist, like where, no matter what dynamic you have. And um, therefore, it's kind of like there will always be people who take advantage. There will always be people that sort of swing the lead. But I, I come back to what Hemmer said, you know, we, we had the Industrial Revolution. There were no robots. And there was absolutely a right answer and a wrong answer. And the way that we were educated and the way that we engaged with our work was in, in that repetition of things to be very exact. Well, now we've got robots. We've got RPA. We've got artificial intelligence that can take away a lot of those repetitive transactional activities and actually we do come but that's why we're moving from stem to steam it, it's got the arts in there too the humanity and the create creativity and the the ability to think outside a right and a wrong answer and have this massive shape of gray is a new thing that and that has only come with the you know the fourth industrial revolution because all this other stuff that that is simple and repetitive that is correct or not correct is done by a machine and and the piece that's now missing is, is the, the, the holy human piece that actually computers can't be creative if someone hasn't invited them to ask the question. You know, that some, somebody had to author the algorithm. Some, you know, a human had to think of something to put that to task. It, it may grow its ability to do that in a better and better way. But, you know, there was, there was always a human parent, if you like, to create the algorithm first. And so there is there is no longer black and white which is where we've lived in that familiarity before and I, I i totally agree with you and uh, just one thing to add when we're thinking about psychological safety you asked the question up as to whether it was like an individual's responsibility or was that of the organization i actually think even that itself is being disrupted I, you know there are platforms now that are in organizations where people can anonymously submit you know where they have felt um, they've been treated unfairly or in the wrong way or harassment and that information is it's almost like it's crowdsourced so you know it's a very very different it's a very different approach all of that's being dismantled played with and I think it will look very different as we as we move forwards actually you've got a good point I have a question I must ask because um lightening things up but this is a what what rick and i would call a chutzpah masala question 
um, <laughs> from Bill Frezza, who I, I know very well. So thank you for asking the question, Bill. Here we go. Has shielding an entire generation from bullying and negative criticism during their childhood and education left them unprepared for the real world, demanding that world adapt to their need for psychological safety via speech codes, HR harassment, hostile environment policies, etc., etc. Question mark. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I would, I would, I have, I would have a question really back to say, have we shielded an entire generation from bullying and harassment? Um, you know, I think. I think those things absolutely exist. I think they perhaps exist in a different form today and in, a, in, a, in perhaps in ways that, you know, like somebody of my generation is less familiar with. But I think um, that human interaction, they still exist. I think they take form very, very differently. Um, and actually, going back to the point I was making before about those anonymous systems and technology that enable some of that kind of highlighting some of those cases, I think that our in corporates and businesses, you know, organisations, they have policies and procedures that are, have been in place for the last 20, 30 years to deal with things in a very traditional way, where the things that we are facing today are really different, you know, like, do big corporates have really robust policies on, I don't know, cyberbullying, just as an example. Yeah. You know, so I think, I don't think... Um, I'm not sure people have been completely shielded. I don't know if you can completely shield people. Um, I think it looks and feels different today. Um, and it might feel alien and different, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I think, I think your friend was vaguely touching on the snowflake generation. <laughs> and um, I, don't, I don't think they've been shielded. I look at the behaviours in the playground that my daughter experiences. I look at the dynamics on a, on a trade floor inside of banking. Those behaviours still exist. What is different is um, people, individuals are, are feeling that it's okay to call it out and say, actually, mm. I don't accept this. I will not put up with this. I do not want to work in a space that behaves like this. And you, we could sit there and say, you know, snowflake generation, grow a pair, you know, mm. I had it like that. So therefore you have it like that. But who's to say that's right? Um, I definitely don't think it should be a case of you know, oh, well, the sun's not shining, I can't be bothered to get out of bed, and we come back to those people that will invariably take the piss. Um, but at the same time, who, who's to say that they should have to put up with someone bullying them or diminishing them or telling them that they're not right and everybody's stepping back because it happened to them or it's okay, that's, you know, that person just came from that company and we all know everyone at that company lies and therefore, you know, she lies. It should be. Actually, that's unacceptable. And... In, as a culture in your company, if your company is sitting back saying, actually, that's fine, and everyone just has to you know, suck it up, you know, maybe people should be voting with their feet and going to a place where it's not acceptable. Mm. Kate, I really like that reframe you just said, because I think so often we think just kind of shut down and go on with it and quit, quit whining about it, right? We think that's actually somehow more powerful or tough. It actually right. is the opposite. It's the opposite, as you say, right? Um, the real courage is how do we speak truth to power? How do we actually do that and call that out when it's, when it's crossing the line, whether, whether it's for us or our team or in our environment, how do we have that courageous act that we take where we can speak truth to power? And to me, that's actually, that's the, that's growing a pair <laughs> more than just taking it and you know, co co co-signing the behavior in whatever way. And so I really like that reframe of how do we negotiate power? And it's a different conversation. It's a different dynamic today. It's much more of an open playing field of how is this going to work? And I think that's, that's where a lot of innovation and excitement can happen. Rick, question for you, mate, a quick one. You're in San Diego, so you're closer to the Valley. Um, and, you know, we've all played in that space a little bit. Do you think, because um, there's so much innovation coming out of there, there's a whole different mindset of leader in, in that part of the world, especially when it comes to new innovations and companies and, you know, uh, startups and so on. Do you think... Uh, do you think the level of psychological safety, I know diversity is much higher there as well, by the way, right? Um, in, in, in the Valley, you've all got all sorts of people running organizations. Do you think psychological safety generally in that part of the world where you, you're hanging out uh, in these companies seems to be a little bit greater than uh, throwing, throwing you under the bus here than the UK? 
for sure. <laughs> You're not going to get your visa into the UK now, mate. <laughs> Immigration police? I'm kidding. No, no. In all seriousness, I mean, there's something about California and the West Coast. It's not just the Valley. I'm seeing this a lot in LA and also San Diego too. But I mean, the, the, the Valley has been ahead of the game in these conversations around gender equality, you know, uh, racial inclusion, uh, diversity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They've been a little more ahead of the game than most of the country in the world in many ways. And so they have been pushing the envelope. And I think this whole thing about psychology and getting coached and that mm. being okay in big corporations and realizing we all have blind spots that I can't see about ourselves and how do we get help and, and really developing the people leader quality that we're talking about. I think there always has been a um, leading the charge on that. And, and even now doing the research that shows when people feel safe, they're more productive, they're more right. engaged, uh, they're actually happy to go to work, they're looking forward to it, they can b bring more of themselves there and not have to just play the, the game, right? And so I think there's, um, I still see that, I'm working, we're, we're working with a lot of different startups in this space and even some corporates in this area. And I'm seeing the leaders that are not getting this right now are, you can already see they're dinosaurs and they're yeah. gonna become dinosaurs. The ones that are really getting the importance of tuning into your people, asking questions, being willing to really receive feedback, not just saying it, but actually being willing to really receive feedback, that's making the difference because everyone's watching you and they're seeing how do you actually walk your talk. That's what's so cool about the new generations. That's what they give a shit about is how are you walking your talk? We yeah. want embodied leadership, not just the, the cool thing on the wall that you have in your frame. That's, that's the change that I'm seeing. And I'm seeing that now ripple out in London when I was there, uh, other places, part of the world too, of course. I'm sure you're seeing it too in different uh, organizations. Mm. Now we do I'm have... To, yeah. I was just going to quickly say, you mentioned there, Rick, about um, playing the game. We all play yeah. the game and I've talked about playing the game. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Simon Sinek wrote a book, The Infinite Game, and it's mm -hmm. great. You know, the corporate world is a lovely thing, but nobody tells you the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. And it's an infinite game. There is no winning or losing. Everyone plays like we win or lose. Yeah. But right. there is no end. It, mm -hmm. The company will persist without you. Um, it will persist when you die, when you leave a role, whatever it is. But, so there are no rules. So how do we play if we don't know what the mm -hmm. rules are? That's brilliant. And I love that last piece just around how do we define winning? What does that mean to our culture? What does that mean to our organization? That's a really interesting question. So unfortunately, we could talk about this another hour delightfully, but we do have to wrap up. I want to leave it to both of you, Kate and Hem. I want to thank you for being on our show. Uh, really quickly, how can people find out more about you and, and the initiatives that you're part of right now? And then I'd love to hear if you have any parting words for our audience as well. How about you, Kate? Um, so by all means, go to my LinkedIn page. I also have a website, katebond.com, um, where I try and post a few things about me, what I think. Um, and I would leave them with, uh, you know, if, you've, if you're struggling to be brave um, and you need some help, by all means, you know, reach out. We, we will support each other. We'll come together and be, be that collective that hopefully does the doing and um, creates that change. Excellent. Emma? Um, equally, I would say go to my LinkedIn page. There's everything about me on there. Um, from there, you can see a link to my company and what we do and the kind of work around consultancy and coaching that I'm involved in. Um, my parting words would be, I think, um, I think somebody, a board member told Elon Musk this, I believe, that um, no one ever came up with a good idea whilst being chased by a tiger so if there's anything <laughs> you could take away that fear or help people to be a little bit more fearless do what you can in those spaces mm. oh i love that quote that's brilliant <laughs> yes thank you so much and i want to let the audience know we're upgrading our website maybe in the next week or two this will be launched but we're going to have a whole speakers page where we're going to highlight each of our speakers past and present and we're going to have information about the two of you and all of our other speakers of how they can find out about you and a bit of your bios as well so I wanted to just mention that briefly too. And then lastly, next week, we have a special guest, David Meltzer uh, from Sports One Marketing. His previous company he was CEO of in the sports marketing world was actually the firm that Jerry Maguire was taken after. And he is really an expert in building relationships. And what does that mean in a post-pandemic world? So we're very excited about next week on Thursday. Stay tuned, same time, same channel, Straight Talk Live. Thank you all for being part of our 
discussions and thank you audience for making this come alive and your engagement and great questions too. Okay, over and out. Have a great week, everyone, and keep innovating, keep psychological safety alive, and keep taking risks.